Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome. I'm Nadira Hira, and it is my deep honor and sincerest pleasure to be your MC for the second ever SDG Action Zone. Last year, the SDG Action Zone was launched as a dedicated event space in the Rose Garden at the United Nations headquarters during the high-level week of the UN General Assembly, literally bringing people of all nationalities from all sectors under the same tent. This space was created with a view to engaging diverse partners in meaningful exchange around the solutions required to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. The collective hope was to complement and build upon the discussions happening in the General Assembly Hall putting SDG action firmly at the core of the debate and providing a portal to bring the world of SDG action into the UN and relatable UN insights out to the world. And so, the foremost collaborative space for engaging world leaders and emerging leaders in honest discussions to supercharge and accelerate solutions together was born. The ambition is bolder, bigger, and broader because this year we have taken this iconic convening space fully virtual, meaning we can reach you where you are and invite more people than ever before to join the conversations that happen over the course of this incredibly exciting week. In the next three days, we will again convene leading thinkers, actors, creators, and activists through frank debate, challenging discussions, inspiring showcases, and thought-provoking performances to drive the exponential change so needed for people and for planet. Each day, we'll explore critical issues in the context of three key complementary themes, people, planet, and partnerships. Today, it's about people. We'll focus on leaving no one behind, on protecting jobs, on protecting society, on bridging the digital divide, on reimagining education, and on breaking down the barriers for women to lead us out of crisis and into a sustainable and just future for all. We will focus on people, as people are at the heart of these issues. Tomorrow, we'll move our attention to the place we all call home, our planet. We'll be rising up for the climate fight with urgency and optimism, exploring climate education, climate action and human rights, and risk and resilience. We'll explore the blue economy, green transportation, and life in harmony with nature as we discover indigenous solutions and ways in which we can and must maintain the fine balance of biodiversity. Then, on our final day together, we'll turn our lens on the collaboration that's so essential to protecting and supporting both people and planet, the partnerships at the core of this agenda. Thursday's program will explore what the world really wants and needs, the unconventional partnerships, innovative leadership, intergenerational resilience, and grassroots solutions that are only possible by smashing silos and working with each other. We will highlight a new generation of impact, a new era of factivism, and together we will dare to reimagine as we bring our attention to the meaningful mobilization it will take to achieve the 2030 agenda in the critical decade ahead. Our incredible speakers are experts in their field, leading figures and effective activists. Their voices represent a wide range of perspectives in society, diverse sectors, geographies, genders, races, religions, cultures, and more. We will be joined by inspirational leaders, national and local government representatives, young people, business, academia, multilateral organizations, civil society, activists, advocates, media, journalists, entrepreneurs, sports organizations, creatives, UN agencies, faith leaders, volunteer networks, movers, shakers, doers, connectors, and multipliers. Passion abounds. So are you excited yet? I know I am. Through a range of dynamic formats from 45 minute deep dive discussions to seven minute lightning talks designed to enlighten, inform, challenge, and uplift. This is the place for candid conversation, honest stories, bold analyses, and personal perspectives that will explore groundbreaking, action-oriented solutions. Now naturally, before we get started, we have to do just a little bit of housekeeping. First, a quick FYI. We are taking COVID-19 as seriously as you do and should. There are just a few of us gathered together here in real life, and we all received negative COVID tests before coming to this small temporary studio, where we'll stay until we're done broadcasting the 2020 SDG Action Zone for you. And just what's in the zone? For an overview of the entire program, you can download our event schedule at sdgactionzone.org. You can also curate and customize your SDG Action Zone experience using the filters on the program homepage. That's where you'll find more about each session, including speaker bios, and which stage the session will be featured on. 
Speaking of, inside this virtual SDG action zone, we have three stages. We'll be featuring content concurrently, so you may have to make some tough decisions about which stages to join when. But don't worry, every single session and talk being shown here this week will be available to view on demand in our virtual library. Keep an eye on that space and you'll never miss a beat from the zone. What's more, while our speakers are sharing their innovative ideas and approaches to reimagining our world together, we want to hear from you. Join the conversation using hashtag SDG Action Zone. And even better, if you let us know which stage you're watching, your questions and ideas may feature on that stage's live Twitter wall. Just make sure to use hashtag stage one, hashtag stage two, or hashtag stage three, and we will find you. We want to make this conversation bigger and broader than ever before. And that means we need to hear your voices. Please post on all your social platforms too, and feel free to tag at SDG Action. And don't forget, send everyone you know to sdgactionzone.org. Share what's happening with your communities, colleagues, and friends. And let's use this moment to activate and inspire SDG Action. So, shall we get started? It is my great pleasure to welcome you all across every time zone and region to the 2020 SDG Action Zone. Last September, an inspiring turnout of communities and leaders came to the United Nations General Assembly High Level Week to highlight solutions and demand greater ambition to create a sustainable future for all. Their momentum was carried forward into the start of 2020 when the Secretary General provided a wake-up call saying that we must urgently change course to avoid irreversible damage to people and the planet. He warned of the four horsemen, geopolitical tensions, the climate crisis, global mistrust, and the dark side of technology. Together, they represent four looming threats that endanger humanity's progress. Just a few months later, this apocalyptic warning is even more relevant than ever. Around the globe, societies are reckoning with climate disruption, geopolitical tensions, and intolerable injustice, all of course compounded by COVID-19 pandemic. However, even in the bleakest of moments, there is hope and opportunity. COVID has put a pause, but we can use the recovery as a springboard to create a more prosperous, equitable, and sustainable world. We are at an inflection point for people and planet. Now is the moment when leaders and citizens need to act on the scale demanded by the Sustainable Development Goals. We are standing up for people around the world, but we must do more. For women and girls, nearly one in five of whom has experienced violence in the past year, we must get to zero tolerance for the tens of millions of children who could fall into extreme poverty this year and risk remaining out of school. For those with disabilities who have suffered additional burdens during national lockdowns. And we must stand up for our planet, joining the millions of young people who are demanding that we take climate action now. Our SDG deadline is looming. The decade of action requires our urgent collective efforts and our bold commitment to transform our world. We need a reinvigorated multilateralism, inclusive partnerships of all sectors and stakeholders that will lift the 2030 agenda into the coming decade. We need to raise our ambition, inspire a massive movement and supercharge ideas to solutions on three major fronts, poverty, gender equality, and climate action. The UN's global broadcast film, Nations United, was created with this spirit to inspire change, mobilize action, and reimagine what is possible. Nations United tells the story of the world as it is, as it was, and as it could be. It focuses on facts and solutions. It recognizes the need for policy based on agreed up-to-date science. And it makes a call for global unity and solidarity. Let me highlight a few of these solutions and opportunities now. Ensuring equality will require a major expansion of social protection systems, a global investment in peace, and a reimagining of education, health, jobs, and financial systems. Tackling gender equality will require investing in women's economic empowerment, laws that protect all women and girls, bringing down long-standing cultural barriers that reinforce gender stereotypes and violence. Responding to the climate emergency will require halving emissions by 2030, ending fossil fuel subsidies, and the building of new coal-fired power plants 
and investing at scale in renewable energy to reinforce the climate action needed for just transitions. We know the facts, we have the solutions, now we must act. As an integral part of the SDG moment mandated by Member States, the SDG Action Zone invites people from all around the world to come together to act in support of the SDGs. This UN General Assembly is unique. As we have the opportunity to democratise participation through our virtual meeting and ability to connect across the world in one moment. The UN at 75 is an invitation to reimagine the power structures of the world, recognising that true power lies in the hands of everyday people, seeking dignified, more self-actualised lives. We're calling on all of you, activists, students, business leaders, government representatives, faith leaders and stewards of your community to join hands in ambitious action and shape a course for our world delivering on the global goals. Everyone has a stake in our future. I urge you to amplify your voices and create an unstoppable movement for transformation. Together, we can realize a peaceful world of justice, dignity, opportunity and hope. In the words of the Deputy Secretary General, we know the facts, we know the solutions, so let us act. And the people we'll hear from now, from leading activists to leaders in the philanthropic world, are doing just that. They'll kick us off with a conversation unpacking the facts and solutions that could make transformative change a reality in this critical decade of action to deliver the global goals. And we may even get a sneak peek into the making of Nations United, a first-of-its-kind global broadcast that sheds new light on the urgency and the opportunity of the SDGs. Uh, hello, um, I'm Richard Curtis, writer, director, and UN Sustainable Development Goals advocate. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to be here with Amina, one of my great um, heroes in life. Uh, also good, uh, because quite a few people think that um, my films have made the world a lot worse. So it's very good to be in a position of trying to make it better um, with the sustainable development goals. Um, and so, you know, I'd like to join all of you in a welcome to this virtual SDG Action Zone. Uh, very well named, uh, because action is exactly what we need for the SDGs now. And I've really got a bit of a bee in my bonnet at the moment that we should almost start calling the sustainable development goals the sustainable development solutions, because uh, they're not just a list of sort of nice dreams. They really are, it seems to me, a sort of belt and braces list of targets and actions that we absolutely must do. Um, I'm very aware uh, that we're living in the strangest of times in the middle of an unfolding tragedy, really. but. I do think we have to hold our nerve and believe that, you know, in change and that, in fact, sometimes a crisis produces amazing change. My favorite example is that Britain got its extraordinary NHS service immediately after the Second World War. It was a really brilliant abstraction of a democratic need that came from that um, big public trauma. So I'm very glad to be joined today by three friends of mine who both represent us both the grassroots and the giants. So I would ask you to welcome, I'm not quite sure how, uh, in their small delightful boxes, um, actor Dia Mirza, activist Eddie Ndopu, and uh, president of Google.org, Jacqueline Fuller. Um, I'm sure they'll just give their little waves. Um, now, uh, oh, a, a, a very fine wave there from Jacqueline. Um, before we start, uh, if it's okay, I'd like to play a trailer for the United Nations, Nations United film that was just mentioned by the DSG. Um, very proud to be asked to make it by Amina. I think she does represent a really modern UN. Uh, and I think it's done something quite radical by commissioning this film to present tangible solutions that we can be guided by, that we can hold leaders accountable to. I do think it's a kind of action plan, as well as if you watch it, I think you'll find there are some uh, cracking performances by Burner Boy, by Beyonce, 
Um, but also, you know, it's wonderful to see Malala talking now uh, and to see the kind of passion that you get from real advocates like Don Cheadle and Forrest Whitaker and Tandy Newton. Uh, so here we go. Um, uh, this is uh, Nations United. This is a very important story. The important story. In the midst of COVID-19, it's an historic opportunity to look at the facts of the world as it is, and then to focus on the solutions to some of our greatest problems. Today, we feel the weight of history on our shoulders. The whole planet is at stake. The way we have been moving leads nowhere, and that we need to change course. We need to reduce global emissions by 50% by 2030. This cannot go on. You know it, I know it, and we know what we need to do. Poverty is not natural. It is man-made, so poverty is not inevitable. Inequality for women is one of the world's great injustices, and it must be, and will be, swept away. We are bringing young people to the table now, not as a token, but to take that baton, to take up the gauntlet, and to move forward. Fear and hopelessness died. Strength, power, and courage was born. It's a myth that each and every one of us doesn't have the ability to change the world dramatically and quickly. There is power in every decision we make. In the 75 years since the United Nations was founded, the human race has never had to face a set of challenges like we do right now. But together, we can overcome them. There we go, and uh, you can see that film on some TV stations, but all the time on YouTube. And if you watch it, I think you'll, I hope you'll find it really interesting. Uh, Eddie, let's charge straight in. Because um, one of the things the goals um, do is they try and organize all the kind of complex problems of the world into a game plan. So I just say to you, inequalities are at the core of so many of our world's problems, and they're absolutely at the core of the goal solutions. I'm really interested in how you, as a campaigner, faced by the myriad of problems, find the goals useful to you when you campaign? Well, the SDGs represent a vision for the world that we want to live in. I think it's as simple as that. It truly is a remarkable vision that is our North Star. And I think what the COVID-19 pandemic has illuminated for all of us is that the same groups of marginalized communities bear the worst manifestations of crisis after crisis after crisis. Black and brown communities in both the global north and the global south are impacted indigenous people, women, people with disabilities. And so as somebody that embodies a multiplicity of identities and experiences, I am truly heartened by the fact that 17 SDGs represent an entire vision for a new world that is more equitable and sustainable for all. Okay, I mean, I do think that's a brilliant answer because I think the goals, you know, we, all, we we kind of think about them as operating on this grand scale, but their aim is actually to affect individuals' lives and also give people their full potential. And as such, once people have got their full potential, then, of course, the world gets better because you're using every human on the planet. Um, Jacqueline, I'm going to be a bit specific with I've got a bit of a can-do attitude to things. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of uh, Google.org, and uh, I'd love to hear, in terms of the goals, one of the things that you guys are supporting, are doing, that you think are pushing the goals forward. Yeah, Richard, I love what you said about uh, this is a moment for solutions. And, you know, as a tech company, we love thinking about moonshots. And so 
one of the things Google has taken on recently is in being inspired by the global goals. We've said, let's set a real moonshot for sustainability for ourselves. And so we have set out a goal of being completely carbon free by 2030. So not carbon neutral, but carbon free 24 seven. And the cool thing about this goal is that right now it's technically not possible. And so this is really a goal that's gonna charge us to have innovation, partnerships, sharing ideas, sharing technology. Our artificial intelligence team is gonna try to uh, come up with better solutions and then share them to the world. So this is exactly what the SDGs do though, is they inspire us to set moonshots and say, hey, we can come together as a world and create new solutions. Yeah, no, and I'm a great believer in deadlines. I would never have finished one film if there hadn't been deadlines. And I think that is, I mean, it's most simple. That's one of the things about the goals. They're meant to be pushing the time scale um, as, as much as they as much as much they can. Dia, um, I'm going to turn to climate for a second here because I'm one of the things I'm really grateful for with the goals is they pushed me into thinking through climate. I used to think, a lot of people did, well, you're either a development person or a climate person, but that's clearly not true. Um, will you give me a sense of how you of how you relate to the goals and climate, and where they think they're most you, you, you think they're most useful to campaigners? Richard, honestly, before this crisis hit us, I, every time people would ask me what is the most important goal to me, I would always say climate action. Um, and I, I always believe that without climate action, none of the other goals can be delivered in reality. Because the fact of the matter is that we are confronted by an existential crisis. Climate is changing. And the, the, the climate crisis impacts all lives, and especially lives who live in people who live in marginalized communities, developing countries. It affects gender. It affects every possible challenge that we are faced with. So the most important goal to me is climate action. And I think what this crisis has done is that it has put in focus the fact that all life on Earth is connected, that our well-being, our peace, our progress, basically everything that the goals hope to achieve is connected with nature and the ecological balance. And the fact that we have disrupted as much as we have, the way we've conducted business, the way we've developed as, as a race, the, the, the attitude and the approach we've had can no longer continue. So um, I really, with all my heart, hope that climate action becomes the center of focus for everyone to achieve the rest of the goals. Because it, it won't be possible to achieve any of the other goals if we don't do that. I mean, that's so interesting you say that about, you know, climate being so key. I completely agree. I think one of the things about the pandemic is I think it's probably made people believe that really bad things can happen as if we needed to learn. Do you know what I mean? But when you see wow. the disease flooding through New York, you maybe do start to think, well, maybe, wait a second, New York might flood. Uh, you know, you've actually seen uh, a, a bad thing unfold, but also people coming together and taking actions, radical actions that they would never have they would never have done before. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Jacqueline, that your net zero thing is kind of to do with climate as well. Uh, if we can bend away from that, I mean, are, are you focusing? If you look at the other things like particularly sort of di diversity and gender and poverty. Uh, is there another thing there that you'd like to tell us that where you've got a kind of where you're doing a moonshot? Well, I think the other area, Richard, is, uh, you know, as we all come together and say, what can we do to help achieve these global goals? We also have to look at what are our unique strengths? And what do we bring? So as a technology company, as a data company, we also think about, are there specific gaps 
where Google could come in and play a particular role. So with the COVID crisis, one thing that we've done is come alongside researchers and invest the resources because these heroes on the front lines do need the funding and the resources. Um, but in addition to that, we've been sending our Googlers, our employees, our engineers, our artificial intelligence experts, sending them out to groups like, for example, Health Map, which is a nonprofit that's based out of uh, Boston's Children's and also Oxford. It's, it's multinational effort. And they're tracking uh, COVID. They're tracking using a lot of different data sources to understand what is happening now with COVID-19. Where is it headed? What, what are the solutions that we would like to see? So I think the key is for all of us, whether we're a company or a community, individuals, to think about how can we uniquely participate? And for Google, we're really looking to see where we can help leverage technology to the SDGs. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so interesting. I think one of the big changes in the world is that people are asking this question, what can I actually do so i think you know when i started you gave to charity you know i set up a charity you left it to someone else and then i did a movement called make poverty history and you were saying well the government it's really the government's job and now i just noticed talking particularly younger people that they're saying you know in the clothes they buy in the food that they eat in the way that they travel. I mean, I've just got obsessed by money and I've just moved my pension and my bank account to make sure that we're with, you know, ethical and sustainable funds. And I do think that's a point to everyone listening. Don't just look out, look in. Uh, I mean, Dia, if I can ask you that question. I mean, I was shocked. The last movie I made, we had a sustainability officer on the set every day telling us, you know, yeah. why what, were you what, what, exactly. <laughs> Um, I mean, are you finding in your life and in, you know, what can I ask you what you think you're doing as a person as well as a campaigner as an example of what we can do uh, to, to change the world a bit ourselves? Well, Richard, quite frankly, I believe that the world will only change when we change ourselves. So it does start with individual action and choice that we can make every day. Um, the effort, of course, is to find ways to live more sustainably every day to become aware and conscious of my patterns of consumption. Uh, and of course, as a filmmaker, how do we produce? How do we work as a business? You know, what are the choices we're making every day? Um, and, uh, and, and to use that understanding and that, that awareness. So I'll give you a small example. When we were working on a campaign to beat plastic pollution, we trended something called hashtag the traveling bottle. It's become a style statement today, but I'm really glad for it because more and more people are refusing to use single use, you know, plastic bottles and are carrying their own water to work, to the gym, to meetings, to, to every every place they need to be. So I think that, the, the, the I mean, for everybody who's an activist and I, I engage so much with young people and, and they tell me this again and again, we may have overshot the mark for accepting individual action. We need decisive global response to the climate emergency. Yes, individual actions count. Every drop forms the ocean. It will make a big difference when we refuse to invest in non-sustainable organizations, when we refuse to you know, uh, consume things that are polluting to the environment. But at the same time, we really need to push stronger environmental laws, stronger policy, yeah. engage with corporations and industries to make better choices. Because, you know, at the end of the day, until that happens, the individual action will count for something, but it won't count for everything because we don't really control everything. No, I think that's true. I'm, I mean, obviously, that's incredibly important. We should work at all level. I am inspired by this idea that we have got a new consumer revolution Yes. coming It'll soon now. and then actually actually because business is one of the core areas which is going to you know change the world either well or badly particularly after covid and as consumers we can bend businesses and certainly politicians listen more to businesses than they do to people like me uh eddie on this specific thing uh you're in are you i'm, I'm talking to you in south africa now yes that's correct I mean, if you were talking about private action there 
what would you say to your compatriots? What do you think for a person in South Africa? What are the things that they should be doing that will have an effect on the goals? I'm interested in what your priorities are there for private action. Well, for us, um, I think for any marginalized group or marginalized communities, the most important things that we can do is to continue taking up space. Um, I think the work of representation is to facilitate transformation. And that's exactly what this moment is inviting us to do, is to completely overhaul and reimagine the systems as we have come to live in them. And so it really is about ensuring that as a person with a physical disability myself, who is you know, very vigilant about the pandemic, um, it's about naming these communities, not allowing these communities to not only be made to disappear, from public view, but to be made to disappear from the discourse. We need to name these communities and we need to be explicit about who we're talking about, identify these voices and amplify these voices as, as loudly as we possibly can. And so that's part of what I seek to do through my advocacy here. And when you're, what forums do you find this most effective in? You know, if you've got, let's just say the goals are a weapon. Which battle do you use it in? I mean, have you found places where by having the goals and the fact they really have been agreed by every country in the world, they are a promise, they've got a deadline. Do you find them a a, a useful weapon in battle? Absolutely. The goals are incredibly useful because we can hold people accountable to what they signed. But beyond that as well, and I think this is what it's really important for people to understand, the goals are not some abstract public policy endeavor, a public policy enterprise, these are very personal. This is about dignity, it's about agency, it's about self-actualization as a human being, it's about my ability to breathe freely in the world, right? Like that's really what the goals are about. And so linking these large goals about hunger, poverty, education, gender equality, climate action, innovation, all of those are about illuminating the full humanity of all of us. And so framing the goals and making it as personal as possible and then connecting them to the big systems and institutions that we're trying to navigate, that has, has been profoundly useful in the work that I do. Yeah. That's great. I mean, what about you in India, dear? Do you find, are you finding the goals a useful weapon if you are you part of spreading them around there absolutely richard lots of plenaries webinars engaging with government institutions private institutions schools colleges universities um, and i find that more and more education systems are adopting the goals uh, i've also tried to use my instagram platform to have conversations regularly with people who are actually amplifying the goals or doing things that are you know related or connected with the goals celebrating that so right. really bring back the the narrative and the the, the focus um, to the goals in every way possible and i find that you know this is altruism and it's something that the goals to me are altru altruistic in nature it's something that yes like eddie says connects with us at a personal level and it's also something that nobody would really deny or not want to achieve and because i feel the way they are structured they and you've said this yourself richard i think it's conveyed so powerfully in the film that you made uh nations united where the, the goals offer solutions and i think that that's the most wonderful aspect about the goals that this is not some abstract idea these are tangible achievable goals that provide you solutions all we need to do is adopt them understand them and work with them and i i was engaged i was uh, in a in a session with the railways in india recently and it was fantastic, Richard, because there were thousands of people who were a part of it. They've obviously adopted the goals. And it was exciting to see how they in, who, uh, were going to implement or uh, you know, show ground action in implementation of the goals. And there's something that I meant to bring up in our meeting yesterday, but it, I, I didn't have enough time. But a lot of people have been asking, especially activists and young you know, uh, champions of the, the goals, have been asking, is there some kind of a measure 
some kind of a system we can put in place where companies, individuals, organizations can kind of go in there and tick and say, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Now, how sustainable is my lifestyle? lifestyle? Yeah. Can I measure uh, what progress I'm making with achieving the goals? Well, I think that's, that's one of the an idea and, and we should try and find a way to implement it. And companies who've tried to do that do find it a really useful, as it were, SATS test, a really useful mark. And they're often surprised how many of them relate to their behavior. Uh, Jacqueline, just in terms of um, Google's in your name, just in terms of getting it out there, uh, what do you think about that? What, what's the thing that you're most excited about, about trying to sort of spread the goals as a, as a, concept as a famous thing because obviously my hope is they get more and more famous over these 10 years is that something that you're working on as well look in my world when i talk to other uh founders and, and entrepreneurs innovators they want to know two things the what and the how and what's really great about the goals is you've sort of solved the what right we have moonshots we have a very clear blueprint as you said earlier richard these are solutions and so that just takes that off the table and so that we don't have to waste time reinventing the wheel and then they get to focus on what they tend to be good at uh which is creating new value new ideas innovations they focus on the how they ask the question okay who am i as an individual what's my company what's my community what's my network where's my social capital where can I personally invest? Where can my company make a difference? And you know, one of the things that we've seen at Google is that it's a positive, virtuous cycle because our employees are very personally motivated about achieving these global goals. They care deeply. And as they are so proud that Google is working towards these, they wanna be a part of it. We've had to completely revamp how we do our work to enable more Googlers to come in and be part of the teams that we send out and embed in the various nonprofits because they wanna be personally engaged. So from a corporate perspective, this is wonderful because you're actually feeding your employees, you're giving them that sense of purpose, you're energizing them. Um, as part of their daily work. They want to be proud of the work that you're doing. They want to be part of these solutions. So we're both figuring out how, you know, how Google, Google can plug in, how we can come alongside other partners, because of course, no company is going to make progress on this alone. We have yeah. to work alongside governments, alongside influencers, you know, uh, the YouTube community, for example, we have YouTube influencers who care so deeply about this and they're using their voice. Um, we're having a, several of them work on the action zone, the SDG action zone. They've got tens of millions of followers. They're going to inspire their uh, followers, their community to ask that question. And I love what Eddie said. This is not about like some public policy effort. This is about giving people my ability to breathe freely in this world. And that is so inspiring to people. Yeah, I, I really do think that it's such a positive thing. I was talking to um, Mark Carney about the goals. I talked to everyone about the goals. <laughs> but he said to me, you know, he said, one of the real risks to companies now is not being involved in them, that actually people are finding that if employees find you haven't got a purpose, they'd rather not work for that company. And if consumers find out you haven't got a purpose, They'd rather not work. I mean, they'd rather not buy your goods. So this idea that it's actually, um, it's not, it's that thing of it's not money versus morals anymore. It's not value versus values. It's actually a thing which is going to help you do better business as well as, you know, lead a better life leading to a better world. Um, so look, I'm just going to, I think you've all shown, it's been a great talk because I think, you know, I can see a, deep belief in all of you, but also a practical application. And that's what I wanted to give a sense of straddling here. You've got these great big goals, the great big UN, and then our lives, uh, and then how actually you can help make changes that will achieve the goals. So I'm going to finish with a quick fire one, um, which is just um, people watching this, what's the one thing 
you would get them to do tomorrow. I mean, what I used to say is, you know, read the goals. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say that. So my weird one is going to be uh, make sure that your money, if you've got it, is invested according to the goals. This is such a big one because the prospect of, of using, in a way, the problem of COVID to make businesses rethink the world that they're working in and actually make sure that pension money and bank money are going into all the businesses that are doing the best thing. I think that's a real good new tool to go along with your consumer power. But um, Dia, if there's one thing you could say to people out there, here's a thought, tomorrow, why don't you? Um, obviously, I'd like people to watch Nations United as well. Um, but what, what would you have them do? Well, start off with reading and understanding the goals and adopt them immediately because we can at an individual level and um, find one goal that resonates most deeply with you and act on it every day because you can. Yeah, I mean, for people, that's one of the things you don't have to do all 17, okay. um, but pick one and fight for it. I agree with that so much. Eddie? If you can and you are able and you find yourself in the front of the line of opportunity, step aside and amplify the voices of those that are furthest behind the line of opportunity. Okay, that, that is a really important thing. And I feel that movement too. A lot of people, you know, I'm an old white guy. And when you say to people, what are you doing? They do say, one of the things they're saying is I'm stepping aside. I'm trying to let other voices be heard. And I think that that is a really, it's a strange, but that is such an important action um, because you create a space for someone else. Jacqueline, have you got, have you got one top tip for a goal lover? I'm going to say email your CEO, do it tomorrow look at what your company does what you're uniquely good at map that to the goals and find that shared value that win-win where you together with everyone that you work with can really make a difference and um i bet your ceo is going to be interested in your idea okay well i would love that a thousand <laughs> letters to a thousand busy ceos with the word goals in it is my dream Look, I'd like to thank all of you. You're a very, you know, interestingly different group from what, three different continents, uh, all committed. Uh, no, four, including me. Um, so all committed to the goals. Um, I would recommend to everyone to, you know, follow as many things in the uh, SDG zone as you possibly can. You'll always pick up good stuff. Uh, and I suppose my final thing would be, you know, to remember as you change things, you really do affect specific lives. You know, I think one of the things I'm always concerned about is as you move into the generality of politics, you forget the particularity of kind of people's lived lives. And I think one of the things that COVID has made us so aware of is people in our community who it's jo our job to protect by our simple behaviors. And I do think that the simple behavior of fighting for the goals protects, boosts, uh, and reinforces the opportunities in this little community we live in called um, planet Earth. So uh, thank you all very much indeed for being here today. And uh, I know I'll see you all soon. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, <laughs>